thank you for coming. Um, as I said, I, I got a lot of emails saying that people couldn't make it because it's just the weekend that it falls on, but we're, I was previously booked and then there was so much last weekend. So this was the weekend we decided for the talk and the opening. So um, I would also like to acknowledge the support of the Saskatchewan Arts Board. <laughs> Uh, what I'd like to do for the talk this afternoon is just give you a little bit of background uh, on the work that led into this work. I'm not going to go back throughout you know, my whole practice, just the work previous to this that kind of led into this work and give you some information on what informed the work that you see upstairs. So, The first thing I want to do is just... Um, I promise I won't be reading oh, more than this, but I just want to give you a little bit of my artist statement. Um, oh, and I'd also just like to acknowledge the wonderful essay that Wendy Peer wrote, which is available upstairs. Okay, so my current project, Floating World, Worlds, continues my interest in the macro, macrocosm and microcosm schema of ecological systems. While well, my previous body of work concentrated on the biotic, these drawings and paintings shift focus to the abiotic. So that's um, air, water, land, light. The work is informed by emergent and self-similar patterns that can be observed on a micro and macro scale in nature. Through this, my intent is to emphasize the complex interconnectivity of all natural systems. I'm interested in the repeating movement and structure of abiotic systems such as air current, water current, rain, clouds. The work is informed by various visual sources including art history and science-based resources. It is absolutely not my intent to render stri strictly empirical uh, imagery. Art and science sort of integrate in this work and it's really um, a product of the imagination. So I like to have the images oscillate between the objective and the imaginary. So going way back to 2009, I was working, focusing on the biotic, so life forms that breathe air, and um, also life forms like plants and sunlight. <laughs> So I was interested in the smaller elements of the natural world. So rather than producing scapes, like a landscape, like the larger picture, I was focusing on the smaller building blocks and um, focusing on, on things that are very small, the micro, or even things that, that we can't see with our eyes. And I was building up this visual lexicon. So again, um, looking at different references, they're not always absolutely representational. I want it to have the paint applied in a very gestural manner. I want it, the hand of the artist to be present in the work, to kind of move it away from the strictly empirical. So there, it's really science informs it, but it's not science, it's art. So I did show these um, smaller pieces in uh, some exhibitions. Uh, this was in uh, a show in PA that would look familiar to Elizabeth in the audience here. <laughs> and I continued building these. I, I, it was sort of a, a bottom-up process, so I had these ideas, but these interests, but I didn't really know what I was doing with it. This is obviously a studio. In-studio shot, you see all the marks on the wall not in a gallery. But I kept building these um, paintings and uh, again focusing on the natural world, looking at parts, um, plants, animals, their, their structure, their growth, the order. Um, interested in the fact that out of context and by removing scale and representational color, the forms appear similar from animal to plant. Not exactly, but they can appear similar. This is where I'm getting nervous looking at you, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> Plant scientists over there. <laughs> so, uh, again, this is studio shot. So, I, I realized that I, what I wanted to do was alter these. So, they had a little more of an organic feel, so I shaped them. 
So what I was interested in doing is having this shape kind of repeat what you see in some of this, this kind of more organic, circular, oval kind of shape. And um, so, so we had, uh, so I had that repetition. I also wanted to bring them up from the wall so they weren't flat. They, they, then I took all the pieces and they have backings on them. So they're raised up from the wall. You can see a bit of the cast shadow there, getting studio shot. Um, so that way that they became more of an object and the, the, this was uh, what was to become a very large, very large installation piece, which I'll show you some images of. But first I just wanted to show you some of the imagery that informed the work. So not that I was trying to make the, the stuff look like this, but this is what goes in informing it. So just stuff that I'm interested in, I'm thinking about, again, I'm making art, I'm not trying to uh, do science. So. so this is human cells. So you can see the correlation. This is plant cells. So again, there's a correlation, but again, think about removing the color, the size, the context. There's similarities to begin. This is animal cells. Uh, the nucleus is stained red in these. So some of, some of the uh, images that I was looking at to inform the work, some are photographic images, some are scientific illustrations, and some even were vector diagrams, so really simplifying it. So here's a diagram that shows the mitosis in an onion uh, root cell. So it's just like, I just get carried away looking at images like this because of the mark making. So looking at stuff like this, I knew in the back of my head, I need to get back drawing and really manipulate, like directly manipulate, you know, painting, you kind of at uh, brushes, but drawing, you know, you're, you're kind of right in there. So I knew that the mark making, and the fact that the imagery, imagery could seem abstract, but really it's not. But it has this, you know, it's marks and it's shapes, which I love. So keeping that in the back of my mind. And then, you know, so this, this kind of imagery is repeated in the paintings. So I was looking at propagative and reproductive systems, cell structures, etc. So plants, human, and then I put together this side. So the one side is the, the vector images, and the other side is uh, you know, the, the diagram, one plant and one human. So you can see the, the repetition of the shapes and the forms. So this is a, a, a close-up of the uh, installation piece that was called Systems that um, used all these small paintings. And some are from plants, some are from animals, some are completely fabricated, some are kind of hybrids. Uh, this is from the AGR, the Art Gallery of Regina. You can see that kind of putty colored wall. And this is from the, uh, I did the installation, a smaller version of it in Esteban. And so I think they show a little better against the white wall. So this, <laughs> this is, this is the, the installation at the Art Gallery of Regina. Yeah, so it grew. So I was doing these small things, but it became large. But that was part of the idea. So it repeats, repeats, repeats. So the building blocks, so these smaller <coughs> things make up the larger. So, you know, small to large. And then the, the shape repeat, repeats. And I was interested in having this flow, this movement across the wall. Um, so this is, this is the back of the Art Gallery of Regina. So it goes across. It starts on the corner of the one wall, goes right across the back wall and across the other wall. I did have some other works in there that are, you know, not the shaped installation piece, but just um, paintings on sheets of paper, some framed, some unframed. Yeah, so this installation was almost 700 pieces. And it was lucky there was a long weekend before the opening <laughs> day, because <laughs> I was in there. 
been a scaffolding all long weekend installing. So there's another shot of it. And this is a shot of the installation in Esteban. And um, this piece was, was smaller. It is still, it was over 150 pieces and it went across the back wall and around the corner. Um, but with smaller walls. So. so this is, um, uh, as I was saying, I was also showing other paintings with this body of work. And I want to show this slide only because of the, um, this painting here. So this is part of this body of work called Systems. But that piece, um, although I put it in here because I thought of it as these masses kind of, it was called, this particular one was called, is called um, System Streaming. So I, I thought of these masses in fluid. It's very organic sound. <laughs> um, but when I, had, when I looked at the, the painting, um, it suggested land mass and clouds. Like, you know, we, we, can have, we have all these satellite pictures now. So that made me think about the marks that I was making, these circular marks, and um, water and clouds, and those, the air currents. And so this was really the beginning of the body of paintings that you see upstairs. So the shift moved from biotic to abiotic. So again, that's things like soil, water, air, temperature, sunlight. And um, I furthered my interest in emergent or self-similar patterns. So these patterns that repeat in nature that are self-similar. So I repeated the marks, built up the paintings, some opaque paint, some semi-translucent paint. And so images like this started to inform that body of painting. So this is open and closed cell clouds. And this is clouds over the land mass. And I have to say in this painting, I love that you can see the shadow of the clouds. It's just one of those <coughs> wonderful things when the work was installed upstairs, I love the reflections on the floor. <laughs> what a nerdy thing, but I love it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, some of the marks are these kind of circular marks that are built up, the texture's built up, and then there's these kind of streaming marks. So, um, I, you know, thought of things like uh, lake effects, you know, from satellite images. So there's just a couple images of the paintings. So the, the texture, they're, they're really heavily textured. Um, so the drawings that we see upstairs as part of the Floating World series, the same in intent, um, the same content as the, the paintings that I was interested in uh, the patterns in nature that repeat on small and large scales. So it's more of the imagery that informs the work. So this is a vortex of the weather system. This is a visualization, a NASA visualization, so <clears throat> it's a rendered image of ocean currents. So again, you know, we think about removing the context of scale and color, the patterns are similar, so we can definitely see the similarities in there and there. And thinking about things on, on a large scale, um, the ocean currents are strikingly similar to the meteorological images. So again, wanting to demonstrate the interconnectedness of um, the uh, abiotic systems. So ocean and atmospheric uh, circulation, similar patterns. And, you know, similar patterns happen on a small scale and also on a micro scale. So this is a model of water molecules, um, liquid and ice. So this 
So we have all these kind of circular plat patterns along with these kind of streaming patterns. Um, so, yeah, and, uh, you know, I put some of these in just so that the imagery, you can see the, again, how on a small scale to large scale, the patterns repeat. So we've got, you know, the crest of the, the wave in here, but you can see that that, that shape is repeated within and overall in that image. And the same thing with the, the ripples in the sand here. Small, the small ripples are similar to the large ripples. And then just, you know, the, the clouds like these float, floating water molecules. It's astounding. <laughs> and light. So the other thing that went into, uh, that inform, informs this work is, as I said, art history. So da Vinci in particular, and da Vinci's studies of water, he had a great interest in water, and he did drawing studies of water over and over again in his uh, sketchbooks. So he studied the movement of water, plus made drawings of flash flooding. I guess he had a fear of flooding, flash flooding, that um, this was going to happen on a large scale. Who knows? <laughs> he might not be far away from that. Um, so he also did those, you know, kind of mechanical invention drawings uh, of um, ways, uh, inventions of how water could potentially be controlled. So looking at his water drawings, and you know, to me they're kind of like clouds and water and dust and everything all at once, and this churning chaos, but yet there's, there's order in there. You can see how he uses the kind of the same marks over and over again. Like those waves, those curling waves and just the water just <coughs> rushing through. And the other, other art historical info oh, that relate hard. to the work that I'm doing, and that's classical Asian ink drawings of landscapes. So you see a mark or a shape or a form that's repeated again and again in these works. That, so it repeats on a, both a small and a large scale. And one of the things I particularly particularly admire in these works is the use of the, the negative shape or the negative space. So the areas that aren't filled in are as important as the areas that are filled in. And that's something that I feel is important to my uh, series of drawings upstairs that the, that space is left for a purpose. It, it, it's just as important as, as the marks. They, ha they, they carry equal weight. And I just threw this one in because this is something that's always fascinated me, and I'm not really sure how it happened. But da Vinci, when you look at da Vinci's paintings of landscapes in the background there, they look very much like Asian landscapes. So he was supposed to be the first, the first ever landscape, first person to ever make a landscape in, in Western art, but certainly not in Eastern art. If he saw those paintings, I don't know. Okay, so that um, my series of drawings. This is again a studio shot of them up on my wall in the studio, and the series started with the thirteen or sorry, fifteen by thirty inch drawings. So they're they're all graphite. Um, they're built up by various methods of mark making that's repeated throughout the drawings. Um, they're not meant to be representational at all. Um, you know, I have this series, uh, or this various ways of making the marks which are repeat. And, and knowing that they're going to suggest land mass or cloud mass, um, 
things that might suggest weather cells or light rays. But not specifically working towards any uh, uh, set representation. So I like the fact that they can be read different ways. That's part of that uh, interest in the interconnectedness. So they could be also read as microscopic or cosmic bodies at once. Louder. <laughs> Sorry, dude. Yeah. Problem with the library is library people are working the same time we are. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I thought they're, they're beating down the doors to get into the yeah. artist. <laughs> so different kinds of mark making. Um, you know, I there's times that I'm using uh, pencil, times that I'm using graphite stick. Sometimes I'm using rulers, I'm dragging the graphite down. Um, and the mark changes on different papers. And I do have uh, a range of different papers upstairs. And that, that, that started by accident because I just happened to have a whole pile of 15 by 30 paper and I started working on that. And then I couldn't find that paper. I don't know what it was, so and I couldn't find it something similar so but that was okay because I was able to kind of expand the mark making with, with different kinds of paper so some of the paper the marks are a little more refined there's a little more detail to them and others are they're a little softer and you know it's all that stuff when you draw it's like it's graphite and paper so if you know if you're not an artist that your head is in there it's graphite and paper. But it's all the stuff that you can do with it. It is so exciting. So there's there's um, there's a lot of eraser work, like smudging with the eraser, lifting out with the eraser. Just about any way you can make marks with graphite, I have in these drawings. And a number of people said to me that there's areas that kind of look like explosions, which I like that. And that's just come from you know the, the drag, dragging of the graphite down, and also you know just moving the pencil uh, in certain ways, and they kind of start to look like explosions. Got some detail. There's also. One of the things that I was doing is I cut um, just from paper, uh, like cardstock weight paper, like circular discs that I kind of use as a template. So you can see the marks that I place the template and then go around the template to, to make those um, you know, sometimes kind of explosive marks. Uh, every kind of pencil from um, 6B to 6H. And some of the areas that uh, there's incised lines, so I cut into the paper in some areas. So, you know, you smudge over that and then you've got a line in reverse. And, um, you know, I, I left a lot of the, the paper. Some, some of the drawings, are the, the marks are built up a little more and more of the paper's covered, and others, um, there's more negative area. And I expanded the series into the larger drawings, so allowing for more negative shape in the picture plane. So there, <coughs> this one is in the show upstairs, and it is 30 by 44 inches. There's a lot of stuff on, I don't know, oh. <laughs> I always make work that doesn't photograph easily. There's a lot of stuff on there that, if you see this one upstairs, that um, it doesn't show well because it, it, the, the smudging is so faint. Or there's erasers that's cut out, eraser marks that's cut out from the smudging and it, it just doesn't reproduce well. This is another larger one. And I 
have done some on tinted paper. I don't have any upstairs on the tinted paper and also used water soluble graphite. So rather than the smudging, those kind of pools are, are made, you know, basically it's kind of like a watercolor and then I can, that drag is actually like, you know, pulling the water down. And I've also used tinted graphite. There is some with tinted graphite upstairs and also some with water soluble tinted graphite. And I have produced some um, triptychs with these. So this one is 22 by 30 and I do have some sets of triptychs of three, three panels that are 22 by 30 each for each of the papers. So, um, any questions so far? <laughs> okay, there's just a couple other things that I wanted to mention that goes into informing the work. And um, so, I just I've got a bit of time, so I'm just going to go into this. So, fractals. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have avoided using the word fractal because mm -hmm. to me, what what, what comes to mind is those 1990s fractal art that generated on computers. Horrible, have no interest in those. But fractal ge geometry, that's a whole other thing by uh, um, the mathematician Mandelbrot was you know, kind of uh, brought this uh, into the world of mathematics. So a natural phenomenon or mathematical set that exhibits a repeating pattern that displays at every scale. So he's someone that, since I started this work, I've been, um, not that I understand the math in it <laughs> on any deep level, but um, it's, it's very fascinating. So this is an example of a fractal. So, you know, again, I, I use self-similar because, again, I don't want to lead people into that image of those fra that fractal art. So, <laughs> so, you know, starts off simple, gets complex. And this is um, frost, which is water crystals that form fractals. And emergence, so I also use um, the term uh, uh, emergence or emergent patterns. So it's a process where the larger entities um, and regularities arise through interactions among smaller or simple, simpler entities. And one other thing I discovered since making this work, you know, I have some of those explosions that kind of come up the top. So, and, you know, thinking about the science part, it's like, okay, well, Yes, this is art, but what would that represent? Oh, it doesn't matter, because I, I actually I decide which way the, the, you know, kind of a cliche of abstract art, but I decide which way the drawings go kind of after, which way is up, which way is down. And uh, how these kind of explosion things or rays that, that go up, and then I discovered sprites. Oh my god! <laughs> They're so interesting. So they're flashes of light that happen above the thunderclouds. And they make these amazing shapes. So some kind of look like jellyfish or angels or broccoli. They, there's all kinds of names for them. So. so that's all I have for my slideshow.